All right, we're going to be starting shortly here. So my name is Deborah Henderson. I am a senior design researcher with Microsoft, uh, Xbox specifically. And I'm going to be talking today about Quantum Break, um, and in particular the methods that we use to test this product, because it was a little bit of an unusual or odd product. Um, the first thing I want to mention is that I'm going to add a little narrative caveat to this. Uh, lots of many, many, many types of testing that we did. We did do game testing. This is a screenshot from the very first game test that we did. I will not be talking about most of the game testing that we did. And the simple reason is that um, most of the methods that we used, I think more people in this room are going to be conversant with. Instead, I'm going to talk about the challenges that were sort of specific to quantum. First off, this is a story about time travel. Those never make sense. Second, it was simultaneously a game and a television show. So you played the game for a while, and then you stopped and you watched an episode of a show. Third, uh, because we weren't real sure how popular this show would be, people could skip it, which meant they could basically skip half the narrative if they wanted to. On top of this, there was a bunch of sort of, there were a number of junctions where you could sort of vary what, what was happening in the story. Um, so if we look at these challenges, they basically break down into three sort of problem sets. One, what was the content of the story? Was it engaging? Was it um, wonderful? Was it sort of um, everything we needed it to be? Two, how did the format of the story work? Um, did, it, did it in fact work was one of our basic questions there. How are we going to transition people from game into show and back again? Three, how did player interaction play into the experience? And how are we going to test that? And then I'm actually going to add a fourth one, which was polish because polish turned out to be incredibly, incredibly important. So to begin with, the content of the story. And the real challenge with the content of the story was that it was about time travel. And the thing about time travel is it sort of starts off making a fair bit of sense. Um, and then it starts getting a, a little bit more complicated. And by the end of it, you have no idea really what's going on. And it's really, really prone to paradoxes. Um, and while this is the Terminator, we did actually have a moment early in production where everybody on the Microsoft side of things turned to our narrative designer and said, you know, I, I don't actually understand what this, could you like just tell us what the story, we ended up with a graph that looked a lot like this. And it took a full hour for him to try to explain to all of the people who were actively working on the game what in the hell was going on with time. Um, and the way that we sort of tackled this from a UR perspective is that we did a number of narrative usability. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this because I've already actually presented at this conference how to do a narrative usability in 2014. But essentially, uh, we do a series of storyboards from beginning to end. Um, they look a lot like this sort of slide on the, the, the side there. And you put in a picture, you describe everything that's happening on the screen, and you ask participants to sort of walk you through it. What's going on? What makes sense? What do they think is going to happen next? We're looking at understanding issues. And initially, when we did these, we focused only on the game. And the reason we focused only on the game is because that was the only part of the story we knew people were going to get. So that really needed to work, and it needed to work independent of the show. And the kind of problems that we found were things like, what are the rules of time? Who is the enemy, and does the ending make sense? And these are actually really sort of common issues that you see, particularly in narrative usability. They just tend to sort of start off making sense, and by the end of it, it's just like kind of a train wreck. And so the team iterated on that a number of times, and we then started layering in the show. And we did it, again, in a narrative usability, but we did um, visually denote when we were moving to the show. And we, we did this in a fundamentally non-subtle way. So when you got to the slides that were covering the television show, there was an enormous television. And we wrote the slides within the television screen. It was really, really non-obvious. And we had sort of one question here, which was, is it one story? Or is it two? Because we knew that the game story made sense, but now we were adding all of this extra information. Would it feel relevant to the game story? And the good news was, yes, actually, it all sort of came together. And we got feedback like this. I can't even tell the difference. I'm just reading it as one story. Um, and people were actively confused that we thought it what might, in fact, be two stories. Um, and this is despite the fact that there are actually two protagonists, Jack, goes through the game, Liam goes through the show. So there are two separate protagonists. Now, that was the good part of the feedback. The not so good part of the feedback was that we got things like this. I don't like Charlie at all. I'm kind of hoping he dies soon. Um, this is actually surprisingly common. Um, so on the one hand, this is a great sign in a narrative usability, because the moment you get anybody talking about the characters rather than the sort of minutia of the plot, you, it means they're engaging with the experience, because experience is in the characters. When people are actually engaging with the story and can follow it, they talk about character, they don't talk about facts of the story. 
The problem here, and this is also, again, really common, it turns out, is that there were too many reversals, right? The, design, the narrative team was trying to surprise people, and they were ending up with situations where there were characters who had those sort of fake-out deaths where they're supposed to be dead, but surprised they're not. And the feedback we were getting from participants was, boy, I really hope he's dead. I don't like anyone. They all just betray each other. These are terrible people. Why would you like any of them? So. That was very useful to know, and we worked on sort of smoothing out some of those reversals. And the other thing that we did is we started following through once we engaged in playtest. And here I am going to say I'm using this in a technical to Microsoft way. Um, by playtest, I mean we have a large end so we can not ask emotional questions like fun and things like that. Um, and when we tested characters, we focused on three big questions. One, character memorability. If I showed you a picture, could you tell me who it was? Because there were a lot of characters because we had two full stories that people had to keep track of. Second, could players actually articulate the goals of the character in a given moment? Because then it wasn't just a, oh, I remember that face. It's a, I know who that person is and I know what they're trying to accomplish. That's really sort of the better metric for do you know what this character is? And then third, we asked about the sort of perception of the character. Was the character playing the way they were supposed to? So the next slide I'm going to show you is actually um, from one of our reports, so it's not built to be presented, so I'm going to just walk through it slowly. So this is the type of data we presented our team with. Um, the particular character here I'm presenting here is Old Paul. So the story of Quantum is Jack, Paul, BFFs, get together in the middle of the night, to turn on a time machine, because that's a good idea, and things go terribly wrong. Jack gets super cool Spider-Man style powers based on time disaster, and Paul disappears into time. And he comes back, and he's old. And old Paul is the antagonist of this whole thing. Now, we asked this question right after Old Paul had essentially been introduced, and there were a couple of interesting things. First of all, 40% of participants did not remember Old Paul. That's not good. Um, so we stopped and we fixed that. We gave him a moment where he was reintroduced as a character. He was a very important character. You gotta follow him. Um, the second thing, though, is that when we asked people who remembered Old Paul, like, what was he trying to accomplish? They didn't really know, but that was okay in this moment because, of course, it's, that's kind of the mystery of quantum, right? Like, what is old Paul trying to do and why is he doing it? He started off as such a nice guy. Why is he so evil now? Um, this is sort of what you're trying to discover. Um, and indeed, more interesting data in some ways is the stuff that I'm not actually showing here, which is what people thought his goals were. They were, nobody got it, right? It, like, that would have actually been the flag if people were like, okay, here's what I think happened. I think he moved forward in time and got trapped there. And like, if they actually could explain what was going on, that would have been a concern. In fact, what they said when they were like, I think he's evil. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that, I guess that is his goal. Um, so the other thing about Paul is that because he's an antagonist, we sort of have two uh, common metrics that we ask of all of our characters. One is liking, um, and the other is quality. And the reason we separate these out, of course, is because while they tend to be correlated, um, you're not supposed to like all characters. And indeed, a good antagonist, in my experience, has the gap that you're seeing here, where quality is higher than liking. High quality character, but I don't really like him. He's fighting me, right? And then finally, the last piece that we did is we went and we asked people, we gave them a list of adjectives and asked them to select amongst them, and we just sort of looked to see which were statistically reliably showing up and which were statistically reliably not showing up, and those are the blue bars. Um, and the goal here was to actually make sure that Paul was actually coming across as smart and effective, right? Because if he was just sort of like um, a fussy little weenie or something like this, even if he was coming across as an antagonist, that would not work for the story that we were trying to tell. Now, what's great about all of these methods is these are actually super easy to layer onto our standard playtest, right? Really easy to do a gameplay playtest and add these sorts of things on. That was not true of everything we did um, because the format of the telling uh, presented a number of challenges, specifically the television aspect. So the way Quantum was structured was as this. Gameplay section, which we sort of pretentiously referred to as acts, followed by an episode of a television show that you could watch or not, and then followed by another active gameplay. So, turns out, making a television show is not the same as making a game. And this 
raised some problems just from a practical standpoint as we were going through them. So the first problem, and I'm just going to introduce these as they impacted research, um, was the production schedule. It turns out that when um, you're building a television show, what you want to do is make a, a lot of really detailed plans and really get it right, and then shoot all of your footage, and then you're kind of done. Uh, because shooting the footage and actually having the scenes and having all the actors in place, that's what's expensive. You can't really iterate as a result. And so the way that you mitigate risk is you push out the show for as far as possible. You want to put this at the end of production. And it's because games, of course, are always in flux. They get scoped in various ways. And any sort of challenge that the game sort of couldn't handle, um, we needed to be able to accommodate in the show. And the only way we could do that is by not actually making the show until really late in production. So how do you test something early enough to say, this is a good idea, we should continue to spend money on it? Um, and the basic answer we did was sort of a twist on something that we already do, typically in games, which is a vertical slice. Um, so we did the sort of traditional vertical slice of the missions in the middle of the game that you polish up and figure out your production pipelines and things like that. But we also actually added an element of the show when we built the vertical slice. And in this case, what we did, it was not a complete episode, but rather a previously seen on video, as in last week you saw, and then there's like a sort of sizzle of the plot, and then we move right into the episode, except in our case, there wasn't an episode. We just sort of had you play some game and had you watch the sort of sizzle. And there were two big questions here. One, would players just straight up reject this format and be like, I hate this, this is terrible, I'll never show this to me again. That one was pretty easy to answer because they, they didn't say that. They thought, no, this is actually kind of interesting. I'd love to see, see how this actually turns out. The bigger question for us was actually around could characters cross between the media? And this is a big concern because this is actually one of the first really large points of contention between design and UR. What design was worried about was the uncanny valley. You'd bring people in, you'd film their real life face, they'd have all the glorious real lifiness of actually being a human, and then you'd pair this with a no doubt very beautiful but still animatronic version of their face. And the real concern here was that this kind of compare and contrast would highlight the fact that in the game, it, it wasn't as good as a real life person. You couldn't animate that as well. It was gonna make it really, really, really uncanny. And so design's reaction to this was to say, there will be no crossover characters. These two stories are fundamentally separate and ne'er the twain shall meet with the exception of the events that are going on, so the timeline and the location. And this is a real concern for you, R, because actually uh, having just done a whole series of interviews and being obsessed with the fact that experience is in character, I really thought it was important that characters actually cross between these two because that's what made it a coherent experience. Um, this was the problem that we anticipated. We were totally wrong. This is actually the problem we got. We had several characters. These are not the same characters that are actually released in the game, um, but Matt was in the show. You'll note he's a white dude with some dark hair, and Jack was in the game. He is also a white dude with some dark hair. Those are the same person, as far as players are concerned. Lady, lady, same person, okay? We did not anticipate this. Uh, good news, this opened the door to get some slight crossover characters, and I was very excited about this. Uh, bad news, we thought maybe this is due to the fact that we just had a sizzle reel, right? And maybe this is just like, eh, it's three minutes. Like, if you gave them a whole half an hour, they wouldn't have this problem. And so we thought, okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to ignore this. We were wrong. This is going to come back to haunt me. But I'm going to ignore that for the moment, and I'm going to fast forward to when we actually had episodes. Oh, how on earth did we test these television episodes? And the answer is just the way that television does, which is that we built out a dial testing tool. You can uh, hand someone a controller, they get an analog stick, we collect their data second by second, they rate their interests on a one to z um, zero to 100 scale. You can tell the scale is built by user research because it's maximized for feedback, not for beauty. Um, the other thing to notice about this is that we did this with rough cuts of the show, so that green box, that's not in the released version of the show. This is in fact the wonder and magic of television that they can take that back out. There wasn't any of the sort of special effects in there or things like that. Um, and then we paired this data with a survey. We also excluded anybody who flatlined for too long because we just thought they weren't collecting data. But we did actually also have, pair the, have the moderators go and just check in with people who weren't giving feedback because maybe it was their opinion or maybe it was just sort of them forgetting. So what does this data look like? Uh, when its data comes out, it looks like just 
the blue squiggly line. Um, what I've added here are sections based on the, the sort of scenes in the television show. Um, and this is important because it chunks them into sort of meaningful sections. Um, on top of that, I tended to add an average line, which is next to invisible on this slide, but is the yellow line going across. Um, and part of what was useful about that is it gave me a sense of the shape of the entire um, sort of data stream. And the way that you interpret this is much like an EKG. Um, so you're sort of looking for a normal sinus rhythm, or in, in the case of narrative, you're looking for it to actually build as it's going. Um, and rather conveniently, if you then run a t-test against the average, that is in fact sort of what happened, right? We got these sort of scenes, and you could tell from the beginning they started off lower and they ended up higher. Um, and what's interesting about this is, well, two things. At this point, I ended up adding a slide like this in all of my data because it was very confusing to actually read these graphs. Um, this proved to be relatively useful, but that's sort of a sidebar. Um, but the other thing is the way that we interpret them didn't actually have to do with the statistics. It didn't have to do with the t-test. So I'm going to give you a highlight and a low light. Um, the first highlight is uh, at the A, and it turns out we had actually missed something that was a crossover, and it was very, very cool to find. In the sort of Dickensian sense of character, time freezing, okay? People experienced that in the game, they recognized it, and then they saw it in the show, and they got excited, right? And they were like, that's like my game, right? This is very exciting, even though it had a green crate in the middle of it, right? Even though it was not necessarily like magical in the beautiful sense, right? And so this is a highlight. And we can tell because in that scene, it curves up in that sort of beautiful way. Conversely, the car chase at the very end, again, starts off above average. You might think this is good, but in fact, car chases are supposed to build excitement, and this didn't. It, it kind of just was too long, and it, it wasn't good. Right? And this leads me to the second element of um, television production, which is what they can do at this point is edit down. They can't really add more stuff. So it was great when we could point out scenes that were too long or that were just like not doing what they needed to do, because then they could take them out. Right? The only thing they can do really at this point to add excitement is to make better bullet sounds and things like that. So this is how we tested um, all of the sort of format of the telling, but one of the major pieces I'm leaving out of it, this, and I've sort of glossed over, is the fact that player interaction inter like, sort of influenced all of this. So here's a more accurate description of quantum structure. There's a gameplay act followed by a junction choice. This is an A-B choice. And then you got to watch television show A or television show B, and then you went back to gameplay. Um, and the way that the shows worked is um, that it wasn't the entirety of the show that was different, it was much more like The Walking Dead, where certain scenes were sort of swapped in and out based on your choice. Um, and this actually led to one of the more unfortunate surprises about um, television production, which in, in this case I'm going to say, TV is a cake, it's not a Lego set. What I mean by that is initially we thought what you would do is you'd get all of this footage, you would clip it all down, and then based on sort of telemetry and what people did in the game, you would just like stream these sort of segments in order. And like a Lego stat, you could just sort of snap in and out, oh, I want the red roof or I want the blue roof, it'll be easy. Not like that. That's not how television is done. Um, television, if you ask them to do that, views it more like if you were to go into a bakery and they were and to ask for a slice of cake and they were to hand you half a stick of butter and egg and some flour. They say, no, you have to build the whole thing. And that meant we didn't just have to build one episode or two episodes. We actually had to build something like 44 episodes. This was a large technical challenge for the people trying to figure out how to stick it on the disk, which is why we want the streaming solution. Um, but it's also something where, from an experience perspective, this is a really large challenge because we weren't going to get all of our episodes until the very end. The reason there's so many is because on top of the junctions, there are actually these little things called butterfly effects that were sort of these very, very small things. And one of our coping mechanisms with, with this was to just kind of not worry about them. These didn't have large impacts on the story, and so we sort of didn't worry about them so much. The junctions still were a big concern for us. We wanted to be able to test them, and we wanted to actually make sure before we ran out of runway that they, we actually were delivering on the kind of emotional impact and that the choice that you made really did feel different. And so the way that we tested that is um, we used these kind of snippets before they could actually put them into an entire show. And we gave people the first um, 
junction. In this case, you, um, and I should mention in the junctions, you are not playing as Jack Joyce, you're also not playing as Liam, the hero of the television show. You are playing as a third character, Paul, old Paul, the antagonist. Um, and you are making a choice from his perspective. Um, and that means all of your choices are vaguely villainous. Uh, and so the first choice went like this. There was a student who had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, and there was a question of how you were going to handle her. Um, option A was you killed her. This was hard line. Option B was you sort of turned her to your side and used her as a PR shill and, shill and sort of misdirected the population. Um, and what was interesting is when we gave people this choice and we gave them only that kind of two minute segment and we didn't show them the entire rest of the show, we got emotional differences. Um, we, the way that we had to ask this was by asking actually two things. One was about um, enjoyment of the show um, and the other was about satisfaction. Um, and it turns out if you picked Hardline, you were more satisfied with your choice. This was a satisfying choice after you watched the video. If you picked PR spin, it was more enjoyable, right? We got this kind of classic interaction because, of course, one's a really negative experience. You watch somebody get killed. And the other one is non-threatening. The other problem that we had with junctions is that these were super important to us. It was also quite literally the last thing to come in in the game. And this is because they were essentially cutscenes that you sort of walked through and these just always come in late. What can I say? Um, and this is actually why I have these lovely drawings because what I did is I tracked down a UI designer and I said, I need you to make a visceral um, depiction of these choices. And he made me these beautiful drawings. And the way that we would model in playtest these junctions is we'd have people play through the game. And then in the survey, we would present these pictures and we actually pair them with a description of all of the pieces of information that they would be given. And then we would ask for their choice there. And then we would use the logic of the survey to direct them to the correct television show. Um, and we did actually let people play through the game and watch the show and all of our play tests. And we gave them free reign on what they chose and what they watched. Um, and the reason we did that is because there was an idea that these choices should be equally difficult in some ways. And when we let people, and we did end up having to, to bump our end to actually make sort of accurate graphs like this. Um, when we let people choose through all of the episodes, we did find that certain paths were overrepresented. And there was a question of, okay, what do we do about this? And the way that we got at this is we just asked people why they were making the choice. And it turns out they differ pretty significantly. So people who picked the hard line would say things like, staging a PR campaign sounds silly. What is this, marketing manager 2015? Like this is just ineffective. I am a bad antagonist if I pick this, right? Conversely, People who picked the PR spin said, I'm just a big old softie and I don't like killing people if I can help it. They were all playing a third person shooter, I should mention. And so this was sort of an odd response, but it was really consistent. This just, I feel squeamish about this. And they were in fact, not only playing a third person shooter, but they were actively choosing as the antagonist. And so there was a question of like, what do we do with this? And so I actually followed through and looked at some of the other data. Um, it turns out, then when we looked at all of the characters, people um, in the PR conditions in the hard line just differed in what they liked. So in the hard line condition, they really liked the antagonist. But the PR people liked all of the young, heroic characters. And what this told me is this is probably just sort of like a feature of the player. I don't know that there's a whole lot that I'm going to be able to do to talk them into some of this. Um, so what we ended up doing is framing it. Um, and the framing here is very specific. So I blew it up because it's otherwise illegible. But the, the way that we describe this choice is Paul Serene, that's the antagonist, has to choose whether Monarch adopts the brutal hardline tactics. And we do talk about them as brutal hardline tactics because that's what people liked when they picked that one. Or the insidious PR approach. And the goal here was to just lower the niceness of the PR thing. Right? So if you made them more clearly both evil, maybe it would be a more difficult choice. The other big question we had around choice was just, would you watch the show? So when we tested people, we did something a little bit um, uh, sort of cruel in the way that psychologists are prone to. Um, we let them play through the game, we let them play through the junction, we then said, hey, do you want to skip the show? And asked them why or why not? And then we said, never mind, you have to watch it anyway. So we collected the data and then we got more data, which was just great for me. Um, and the interesting thing, well, there are two interesting things. Um, first off, 90% of participants stated that if they were home, they would watch the first episode. And this was before they had seen it. And there's a question of why. And the response that we got, it just, it reminds me of the importance of, in some ways, the work that we do. Um, and this was the response we got. Because it's part of the game, so it must be interesting. Right? This is an act of pure authorial faith. 
justified or not. Um, and this actually raised another problem because the development team looked at this and said, you know, that television show is mighty expensive, right? And one of their KPIs for this, of course, is more people got to watch the television show, which leads, sort of led them to this question. Why, why are we letting people skip the show? Is there any value in that? I mean, 90% of them are going to do it. Let's just take that last 10%. How sad could they be, right? Um, and what was great about this is because I made them watch the show no matter what, um, I actually had data on this. Um, I'm gonna, it's going to take me a sec to, to walk through it because it's sort of an odd presentation here. But one of the things I did with the dial testing is because I paired it with a survey, is actually, actually split people into people who enjoyed the show and people who didn't. And one of the sort of beautiful findings that we had was that the people who liked Hardline um, and the people who disliked Hardline, there was, there was a much larger gap there in the Hardline condition than in the PR spin. And when I wondered why there was this gap, it turns out that people who are prone to picking just shoot the girl in the head and be done are also likely to say, I'd like to just skip the show and go back to killing things, right? There is a self-selection bias here. And it turns out people were correct in their prediction of their dislike, right? Which meant that when we shipped the game, we told them very clearly, this is the screen from there, Quantum Break is the show, is your window into what's going on within Monarch Solutions. So we gave them a reason to watch, but we left it their choice, right? And this begins to feel like a very small change, right? This, this kind of framing feels like a very small thing. And it turns out small things were going to matter a lot in this. Um, and I'm just going to run through a couple of like, quick examples that I think had a surprisingly large impact. Um, the first one, and I apologize, I've had to blur um, young Paul's face here um, because I don't have permission to, re to release any image of him that he has not approved. Um, he was originally dressed as business casual Paul because he was a young businessman, and this is why he owns a time machine. Um, and it turns out that one of the challenges with picking a known actor, and he was a known actor, um, was that people kind of had a sense of what his age was, and we needed him to start off younger than he actually was. And we asked people to estimate the age. The age they gave for him is 41. Put him in a t-shirt, though, he's 35. And this is from the released version, which is why I'm allowed to say this. Um, the other problem, and I mentioned this one was going to come back to haunt me, turns out having four white male characters with dark hair wearing jackets gets real confusing from just like a usability perspective, right? Um, and sometimes this was due to narrative things because, of course, Jack and Will are actually supposed to be brothers, so they are supposed to look kind of the same, but Jack is not supposed to be confused with Liam, and they're, like nobody's supposed to be confused with Paul, right? And we were having trouble with people just keeping track of who was who. And so the way that we dealt with this was to stick faces everywhere. Any chance that we got in terms of like the interactions and the sort of atmospheric storytelling that quantum, like the quantum was, was doing, um, we stuck a face in. And we also stuck them in twice. So even though this is a very odd way to send an email, um, both faces are in there to be like, they're two faces. They are different, right? And this is why we are doing this. The other thing we did is we obsessed about where to put Liam in that first act, right? So after you um, freeze time, um, you are walking out. Jack is the, the guy who's back, you see. Um, and that's Liam there. And positioning him so he was alone, so you could see his face clearly, so he's well lit. He is also, by the way, wrestling the one other character that you've actually run into, which is your driver um, and the taxi driver, who is wearing an atrociously bright jacket, right? All of these things are to be an attention magnet. Um, and we did this to make sure that people could actually spot the characters and see the faces and understand who they were. The other thing that sort of played into this is something I'm going to call the Game of Thrones problem in television production. This was a problem in the beginning, and it turned out to be a strength at the end, which turns out absolutely everybody and their mother works for Game of Thrones. I don't know. And this is sort of a challenge initially because we couldn't hire actors because they're all like, I'm sorry, I'm working on Game of Thrones. Um, but it turns out to be quite useful because when one of our main characters was working very close to Finland and was very, very generous with his time, he was willing to just sort of hop over and re-record a bunch of VO. And every time we, we had him do this, he did it a couple of times, what we focused on was reinforcing the character relationships. Who is he? Who is his, what is his relationship? And all of that kind of thing with um, Jack and with Paul. So one of the things that sort of surprised me is that all these seem really, 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 really small. Um, and they're very important. And part of why I think they're important was because I actually got into an argument with Remedy about 
how likely users were to notice these things. Remedy was actually very, very nervous. They're very proud of their atmospheric storytelling, but they're very, very anxious that people are gonna miss the details. They are little details, let us be clear, right? And so what they wanted to do is to force people to slowly walk through all of the narrative sections, which is terrible. And I didn't think that was necessary. And the reason I didn't think it was necessary was because of videos like these. So, let's see if I can get this to play. Nope, I can't. Let's go back. Nope, I can't. Nope, all right, well, I will tell you about it then. Essentially, you see um, the uh, player walking through one of these cutscenes, um, and as he's walking, he never stops. He always keeps walking, and most of the time, his eyes are on the back of the character that he's controlling, except he walks past a window where one of these moments of atmospheric storytelling is, and his eyes go that way, and the character goes that way, and he keeps going, and he watches, and he follows, and he moves back. Right? This is why I thought that players would be able to notice this kind of stuff. This is why I thought they would be effective at catching these moments. Um, and what's interesting about this is that we had enough of a debate about this that I actually have a pretty good sense of how much these polished details meant because I actually went to Finland. I brought an entire playtest, two days worth of data, and I only talked about the first basically half an hour of the, the game with them. Um, we spent an atrocious amount of time working on these details, in particular on the details in the very first act of gameplay. And I then went back and I retested. And this is what I got, okay? So we grant, we, we do our, all of our scores on a one to five scale. This is an overall fun score at the end of the game. This is the change that I got. I was very surprised by this. So this pops up. I stop analyzing the data and hand it to somebody else who is not involved in any of the changes. I then call my recruiters and say, hi, did you do anything odd? And I schedule a second test so I can just make sure this is not an alpha error. For reference, typically 0.3 is statistically reliable for us as a, as a difference. So this is a large difference. And no, it turns out this was a reliable finding. It came back again. And when the independent uh, user researcher went back through and said, no, I know, what, I know what the difference is, they like the story. And what I think happened is I think we put the tutorials for the story in. I think we got the on-ramp right. At which point, all of the planning that we had done in terms of following from beginning to end came into play. People could keep up with us if they just started off with the right information. They needed them to know what the mechanics were to begin with. Who is the main character? What does he want? Who is this other person? What do they want? How do they interact? What is the relationship? Okay, and now it all unfolds, and as it unfolds, I can follow it, and I can be engaged with it. Questions? Great talk, thank you for uh, sharing this with us. Um, I did have a question, um, and this may be more of a production thing, but I'm more curious about the uh, user perception. But how did the positioning of the, sto the secondary story elements as a TV show that was separate from the game, how, did that, how do you feel that uh, affected the perception of it, if at all? So we never positioned it publicly as that. Um, that was something that we did internally with a recognition that we figured we just wouldn't talk some people into watching it. Instead, we always framed it as this is intended to be a coherent experience and it was, it was meant to be that way. And so they, they always talked about it as a singular experience um, and you just had the choice to opt out of it. Essentially, it was much more like, um, do you want to do side quests? Um, is what, the way that I would think about that. Hi. Um, did you find a correlation between comprehension and enjoyment? You said that you felt that they enjoyed it more because they comprehended it better. So there does tend to be, there's sort of a funny offset in my experience with uh, comprehension and enjoyment. Uh, if comprehension falls, it predicts enjoyment falling. Um, and so it's the kind of thing where I, I've seen that across a number of titles that I have tested. Um, and so I don't know that I specifically tested the correlation there, um, but I'll be honest, what, what I'm really sort of interested in, it, what it, people don't self-assess understanding very well, and so that's not 
great. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of thing where what I will say is we did do checks with everything to make sure that people actually understood what was going on. Um, and that was actually one of the things that, that was one of the things that I had to do when I switched the walking speed is to actually make sure that people were still catching all of the information. And so we did checks like that, but they were more qualitative. Um, though overall, I have said, I will state there is a pattern there. Yeah. Um, when you started working on this project, did your stakeholders on the actual game team have a clear vision they could explain to you about why this thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, in order to get this sort of thing approved, and it is an expensive thing to approve, they, they did have to go through and go through a number of explanations of sort of trying to show um, why there's value and really essentially reversing the perspective and showing from an antagonist's perspective um, what's going on is the back end of the story. And there are just sort of practical and interesting sort of considerations. There are, I mean, there are a number of ways to do it, but they did have to build out a, a clear explanation of why the show would be of value. So. And, and ahead of time, do they have like, we want people who experience this to, to come away with these thoughts, feelings, themes? Like did they, or was there just kind of, we're gonna throw this multimedia extravaganza down your throat and you're gonna engage with it, hopefully. Oh, they absolutely had design goals. I mean, it, I, if they didn't have design goals, I would have stared at them until they had design goals. I mean, that, yes, they had design goals. That's what I test against. Um, so it's the kind of thing where they had to have clear understanding of like what every character was supposed to do and they had to have clear notions of what the emotional beats of the narratives were and that's why narrative designers exist. And so, yes, there were definitely people all over that. So. Hello. Um, I'm curious, back to the participant gap you had with uh, skipping the cutscenes, and I'm wondering, did you share that data with the team? Like, you showed them that, yeah, they skipped and there's this gap? I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. So and that's, then, that was actually um, a slide from one of the reports that I okay. them. Okay. Yeah. So then I'm curious, um, did, was there ever d a design decision because they saw that gap that they were like, maybe we want to test it without participants skipping scenes at all? We didn't let them. We never, we always had them. We, we, until, we, until we started worrying about actually getting people all the way through the gameplay, um, one of the things that we did that we did, so we did one very large um, test that was specifically directed around see, testing the game and the show together. And we bumped the end to something like 60. We also added an extra day, so it was two and a half days because we were worried about getting people through all of the content. There we did not let people skip. Um, later on, as we started to worry more about getting people through the gameplay, not only would um, we ask people to skip if they wanted to and let them do that, but we would sometimes tell them that they had to skip because they were being too pokey in terms of gameplay, and we wanted those half hours back. So. Okay. Thank you very much.